Lord in prayer. He's, he's the answer. He's the one doing his work. Go to Luke chapter 12 with me. Luke chapter 12. Together in our scriptures this evening. Luke chapter 12. As I said when we began the service and the wonderful thought that God brings it all together for us here, at least in this sense, on Triumphal Sunday. We jump right back into Luke chapter 12 after Jesus has encouraged his disciples about the, don't worry, God's going to take care of you. You're in the kingdom, right? God's going to take care of you. And then he challenged them to be watching and to be ministering and serving the Lord, right? So look at Luke chapter 12 and verse 4. What does he say in Luke chapter 12, verse 4? And I say unto you, my friends... Be not afraid of them that kill the body after that have no more that they can do. He says later, fear not, verse 32, little flock. It is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. And then he says in chapter 12 of Luke and verse 37, blessed are those servants whom the Lord, when he cometh, shall find watching. Verily I say unto you that he shall gird himself and make them to sit down to meet and will come forth and serve them. So the day of rest is coming. And, and so here's the encouragement to the people of God. But then there were also those that didn't want anything to do with Jesus. Look at verse 45 of chapter 12. But, and if that servant say in his heart, my Lord delayeth his coming, and shall begin to beat the men servants and maidens, and to eat and drink, and to be drunken, the Lord of that servant will come in a day when he looketh not for him, and at an hour when he is not aware, and will cut him in sunder, and will point him his portion with the unbelievers. So there's a warning in all of this for those that continue to reject Jesus. Well, this evening we get into verse 49. And we're going to see tonight that God's plan was being fulfilled when Jesus rode into Jerusalem on a donkey. God's work was being carried out. This is God's provision. This is the anointed one. This is Jesus the King. Would the people recognize God's hand and then receive Jesus as their Savior and King? No, they wouldn't. Go to chapter 19, Luke chapter 19. This is what, this is in Luke's account of the triumphal entry. Look at Luke 19 and look at me at verse 41. After Jesus rode into Jerusalem on that donkey, and he says in verse 40, the stones would, would praise me because they know who I am if the kids didn't. Look at verse 41. And when he was come near, he beheld the city, Jerusalem, and wept over it, saying, If thou hadst known, even thou, look, look at the words, if thou hadst known, even thou, at least in this thy day, the things which belong unto thy peace. Exclamation point. Only if you had known, but now they are hid from thine eyes. For the day shall come upon thee that thine enemies shall cast a trench about thee, compass thee round, keep thee in on every side, shall lay thee even with the ground and thy children within thee, and they shall not leave in thee one stone upon another. What does it say at the end of verse 44? Because thou knewest not the time of thy visitation. Go back to chapter 12. Jesus, in giving this teaching and helping the people understand would they recognize God's work in Jesus? Would they recognize God's plan being carried out in Jesus? Or would they continue to reject him? And so would they discern the time? If they wouldn't, if they continue to be hypocrites, he's going to use that word later. If they continue to say, we don't need God, we're fine. Look at us, we love God, but we're going to do our own thing. Leave us alone, Jesus. If they continue to reject, they would be judged. And that's what verse 49 starts us with. Jesus warns those who continue in unbelief of the fire of God's judgment that's coming. Verse 49. I am come to send fire on the earth. And what will I? What am I going to do, he says in a sense, if it be already kindled? It's already here. The judgment of God is centered in either accepting and then coming into the salvation of Christ, accepting Jesus, or the judgment of God is here in rejecting Jesus, and now you'll face the judgment of God for your sin. He says, what will I if it be already kindled? Heads up. Heads up. Are you discerning the time? And you'll see it later as we get into our passage. We must recognize Jesus as our Savior before it's too late. Recognize him for who he is. When he rode into Jerusalem on that donkey, 
He wept over the city because they didn't know their time. And that's exactly what we see Jesus challenging the people with in our passage together tonight. Number one, we see this thought of judgment and division. Judgment and division. Jesus is the Son of God. He's the promised one from heaven. That's why, that's what he's calling the people to believe. Accept me as God's Messiah. But they refuse to acknowledge him as the Messiah. So Jesus warns them of the judgment that will come. First of all, he mentions this word fire in verse 49. We read verse 49, I've come to send fire on the earth. The fire that Jesus is referring to is the fire of God's judgment. It's not a wildfire that burns down the trees. This is the fire. This is a picture, a metaphor for God's judgment. That's the context. Look at Luke chapter 3. Remember when John the Baptist came on the scene? Go back with me to Luke chapter 3. When John the Baptist came on the scene as the messenger that went before the face of Jesus, went before the Lord to prepare the way, what did John the Baptist say? Look, Luke, Luke 3, look at verse 9. And now also the axe is laid under the root of the trees. That's a picture of judgment. The axe is chopping away at the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Skip down with me in Luke 9, Luke 3 to verse 16. Look at verse 16 of Luke chapter 3. John answered, saying unto them, All, I indeed baptize you with water, but one mightier than I cometh, the latchet of whose shoes I am not worthy to unloose. He shall baptize you with what? The Holy Ghost, that life from heaven, and with fire, whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor and will gather the wheat into his garner, but the chaff he will burn with fire unquenchable. Go back to Luke chapter 12. That's exactly what we see in our passage tonight. There's going to be a division. There's going to be the Holy Ghost sent from heaven for those who accept Christ, eternal life, God's life, coming to us in accepting Christ. And there's also going to be the fire of God's judgment. In the same person, in Jesus Christ, there is the fire of God's judgment and the salvation that, that of eternal life, the gift of eternal life. So this is what God, Jesus is saying to the people. I am come to send fire on the earth. The axe is being laid to the root. Judgment is coming on sin and unbelief. And he says in verse 49, what will I if it has already been kindled? Here's the point, guys. Don't miss this. Jesus is the dividing line. Jesus is the main emphasis. In him we have peace and safety and rest, but rejecting him leads to God's judgment and wrath. Are we discerning the time? Do we recognize the grace of God in Christ? And have we accepted Christ? Because outside of him, there's fire. So Jesus warns the people, the fire's already been kindled. This fire is the judgment of God. It's coming, and only Jesus can rescue us. Number two, look at what he says in verse 50. This is interesting. He says, but, verse 50, verse 49, I'm coming to send fire, but I have a baptism to be baptized with, and how am I straightened, constrained, pressed, till it be accomplished? Jesus is carrying a burden. And it's a heavy burden. What is that burden? The baptism that Jesus is referring to is the same thing he referred to when he said, I have a cup to drink. It's the death of the cross. Now look at it. Verse 49. What does he say in verse 49? I am come to send fire on the earth. Now what does he say in verse 50? But I have a baptism to be baptized with. So here's what I wrote in my notes. This fire is not coming right away. The judgment of God's not falling right away. Jesus has something to do first before the judgment of God comes, and that is to die on the cross and be the payment for sin. Wow. It's just like Noah. God saying, I'm going to judge the earth, but he gives 120 years for the ark to be built while Noah was called a preacher of righteousness. Here's Jesus, the fire. I am come to send fire on the earth. The judgment of God's coming, but I have a baptism to be baptized with first. 
This is his baptism. This is the work that he's identified with. The idea of baptism is to be immersed, immersed in something. Jesus would be immersed, Jesus would be immersed into the judgment of God that fell upon sin. He would be our sacrifice. Remember when he was baptized in the Jordan by John the Baptist? He was associating with sinners. He fulfilled all righteousness. This is the baptism that he came to be baptized with, to be the Lamb of God, slain before the foundation of the world, die to take away the sin of the world, to be the sacrifice for sin. So Jesus points us to the cross. I am come to send fire on the earth, but I have a baptism to be baptized with. In the middle of the promise of God's judgment, is the offer of salvation. The, yes, the judgment of God is coming, but the cross comes first. The way of life and safety and salvation is opened up through Jesus. John 3.17. Remember John 3.16? John 3.17. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. So the fire of judgment is coming in Christ, but before that is the offer of salvation. The gift of God. Jesus called the people to come to him and find rest and peace for their souls. But rejecting Jesus will lead to God's judgment. A fire is kindled, but there's a, a burden that Jesus has to carry first, and that's the cross. So look at number three. To finish this little section here, there's going to be a division. Everyone must make a choice. Look at verse 51. Suppose ye that I have come to give peace on the earth? He says in verse 49, I've come to send fire on the earth. You think I came to send peace on the earth? I tell you nay, but rather division. Judgment and division. For from henceforth there shall be five in one house divided. Three against two, two against three. The father shall be divided against the son, the son against the father, the mother against the daughter, the daughter against the mother, the mother-in-law against her daughter-in-law, and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. Why? Because Jesus divides. Remember what John the Baptist said back in chapter 3? When he talked about the judgment, the axe being laid to the root in Luke chapter 3, he talked about how Jesus would be giving the Holy Ghost and the, the fire whose fan is in his hand, verse 17 of chapter 3, gather the wheat into his garner, but the chaff he will burn with fire unquenchable, a division. A division, verse 51. He comes not to send peace. Now that's all. Listen. Jesus did come to give peace to all who would accept him. <laughs> he came. He's the peace that passeth all understanding. There is peace in Christ. But in rejecting him, there's only division. Division and judgment. Division because, I wrote it in my notes, because Jesus is the rock of offense to those who do not believe. He's the stumbling stone to those who reject him. That's what the Bible says. There's no getting around Jesus. He, the fire of God is coming in Christ. So is salvation. So there's judgment and division in Christ because you either accept him or you reject him. People and homes divided because of Jesus. What, what's this all about? Because we need to discern the time. We need to discern the truth. God has provided light. Jesus is the answer. We must repent and believe on him. So let's keep moving because that's the idea. That's the call to repent. Number one, judgment and division. A fire. I've come to send fire on the earth. And it's already kindled. But the cross is there. So now there's going to be a division. I didn't come to send peace. I came to send a division. If you don't accept, you're, there's going to be conflict. But there is peace. As we accept him. Number two, a lack of discernment. So look at what he says to the people in verse 54. And he said also to the people, When ye see a cloud rise out of the west, straightway ye said, There cometh a shower. It's going to rain. And so it is. And, and when you see the south wind blow, ye say, There will be heat. And it cometh to pass. Wow. Ye hypocrites. Ye can discern the face of the sky and of the earth, but how is it that ye do not discern this time? That's where I got the title for the, for the message. You can tell the weather. You know, and, and we've gotten pretty good at that, especially with all our technology. Well, this, this storm front, this is going to move, blah, blah, blah. We still don't get it completely right because we're not God, but we, we can look at it and say, oh, this looks like this is going to happen. Pretty high chance of this. And then Jesus says, looks right in the eye, looks him right in the eye and says, 
hypocrites. Playing a game? Oh, we've got this other... God's our God. We're, we're his people. We're going to be all right. We don't need Jesus. We're going to keep doing our own thing. You can discern the weather, but you can't discern what God is doing in me. That's what Jesus says to him. He says, you, you're not seeing the miracles. You're not seeing the hand of the finger of God. You're not seeing, especially as we saw this morning, that I ride into Jerusalem fulfilling prophecy on a donkey to be your king, bringing salvation. And you still don't want anything to do with me. Discerning the time. Number one, he says about missing God's work. Verses 54 through 56. They could recognize the weather patterns quickly, but they could not discern God's work in Jesus. <laughs> the people missed it. He's telling them, Jesus is telling them about God's judgment and his salvation. But they missed it. They're hypocrites who act like they love God and believe him. They talk about God and the truth and God's word. But they've missed this time, verse 56. Look at verse 56 at the end. You do not discern this time. What is this time, folks? This time is what we read to start with this, morning, this evening in Luke chapter 19. The time of thy peace. The time of thy visitation, Luke chapter 19, Jesus says, after he rides into Jerusalem. They've missed it. They, 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 they've missed God's offer of grace and life and salvation in Christ. This is the time of God's grace. It's what Jesus referred to when he wept over Jerusalem. And that's why they will be judged. Jesus is the only way of salvation. Only Jesus can forgive our sin and make us right with a holy God in heaven. To miss him is to miss life. So they missed God's work. Number two, they missed that judgment was coming. Look at verse 57. It gives this clear parable. Verse 57. Yea, and why even of yourselves judge ye not what is right? That's the end of verse 56. Discern the time. Verse 57, you're not even discerning what's right. You're not even seeing what's right. Look at his picture. When thou goest with thine adversary to the magistrate, the judge, as thou art in the way, give diligence that thou mayest be delivered from him. Now, just think about it. Just understand what he's saying here. If you've committed a crime... And your prosecutor, your person that you've offended, that you've, that you've crimed against, <laughs> if they're taking you to the judge, come on, you ran into my car, you're guilty, we're going to go to the judge and you're going to get your, your, your fine, you're going to get your judgment passed on you, let's go to the judge, you're guilty. Jesus says, if on the way, give diligence that you might be delivered from him. In other words, you can say, hey, I'm sorry. I did wrong. Let's make it right. Let's take care of everything that needs to take care of. I'll acknowledge my transgression and we will make restitution and we will cover it and, and the problem will be taken care of. I don't have to go and face the judge. That's what Jesus is giving a picture of. If you're wrong and you're guilty and you're heading to the judge, do what you can to make it right. Keep reading verse 58. If you don't, when you get to the judge, lest he hail thee to the judge, and the judge deliver thee to the officer, and the officer cast thee into prison, I tell thee, thou shalt not depart thence till thou hast paid the very last mite. What, what's the picture Jesus is giving? You guys, we're in the context, right? You're with me in the context. Discerning the time. Not seeing God's hand of salvation. Missing God's gift of life in Christ. So they're going to face God's judgment. Jesus gives this picture you have time to repent. You have time to acknowledge your sin. You have time to recognize your guilt and call upon God for mercy and grace. Jesus will forgive you. Jesus will give you life. If you miss this moment, this is the point. If you miss this moment, this opportunity for repentance and salvation, you'll be brought to the judge. Judgment is Sure and certain. And when you get before the judge, you will be judged. It won't be overlooked. I read this in my notes. The judgment will be sure. It won't be missed. It won't be neglected. It won't be overlooked. So the challenge was to make things right while there is time. Repent today, he says, and trust me. Because judgment is sure. Don't think you'll miss it. That's Jesus' warning. The person going to the judge could have found 
forgiveness and grace on the way, and he could have been released from his judgment. But those who continued to miss the time would stand before God and they would be judged. The people were not judging and thinking what was right, verse 57. They weren't discerning the time. No one escapes God's true and righteous and holy judgment. So today is the day of salvation. It, a corner is being turned in Jesus' ministry. And he's telling them, I'm giving you the truth. I am the Messiah. I'm the one sent from God. If you don't accept me, a fire is coming. And they've not discerned the time. They've, they've had a lack of discernment. Number one, there's judgment and division. There's a warning. Judgment and division. You've got to accept Christ. Number two, there's a lack of discernment. You can tell the weather, but you're not seeing what God's doing, and you're going to face God's judgment. All of this is about judgment and repentance. So number three, a call to repentance. The whole passage is leading to repentance. That's Jesus is calling him to repent. The whole passage is leading to repentance. Judgment's coming. We need eyes to see the truth before it's too late. And the truth is we must repent. Look at this picture he gives in verses 1 through 5 of chapter 13. Now, it's all in the same context. Don't worry about chapter breaks. It's all in the same context. There were present at that season some that told him of the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. That's awful. Pilate was an awful guy. He killed some Jews and, and, and shed their blood in the sacrifice. I mean, this is awful. What in the world? And Jesus answering said unto them, this crowd that says, we don't really want you, Jesus. But look at what Pilate did. Isn't that awful? This crowd who says, we don't want you, Jesus says, suppose ye that these Galileans were sinners above all the Galileans because they suffered such things? And by the way, the expected answer there is no. Verse 3, I tell you nay, but except ye repent. <laughs> ye shall all likewise perish. They weren't expecting that. They brought this up to Jesus, expecting his sympathy, expecting Jesus to say, that's awful, Pilate needs to go. Rah, let's go get him. But Jesus turns it around. Re really, do you think that they were more evil than all the other Galileans? Do you think that's why they suffered that way? Do you think they deserved it? And some of the people in the crowd would have said, well, I'm glad I wasn't as bad as them, or I'm glad that I'm not that bad. And Jesus turns it, turns, it, turns it right around, points it right back to them and says, except you repent, you're going to perish. He didn't say you're going to perish in that way. It's the whole context. Repent now because judgment is coming. And he uses this as an illustration. They say to him, look at what Pilate did. It's awful. And Jesus says, are you ready to face judgment? Verse 4. Now they brought that one up in verse 1. Look at verse 4. Or Jesus brings it up. Hey, remember those 18 upon whom the tower in Siloam fell and slew them? Do you think, think ye that they were sinners? Above all men that dwelt in Jerusalem, you think that they deserve, you think there was something bad in them? No, 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 no. I tell you nay, but except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. Do you get the point that Jesus is making? They wanted to excuse their sin. Before a holy God. And Jesus is telling them very clearly that they will be judged unless they repent. Jesus tells them to see their own sin, their own need, and to repent from their sin. Because, you get this in the, in the, parable, you get this in the pictures here, sin always leads to death and we're all sinners. Oh, I'm glad I wasn't involved in that. They must have been bad. That's what they were thinking. And Jesus says, uh-uh, except you repent. All of you. Jesus brings up this picture in verse 4 so that they'll realize that it's not about who's worse than others. It's about my sin before a holy God. Judgment will come. And we must repent and turn in faith to Jesus. That's the warning. Jesus is giving these people a warning. Before it's too late, repent. It's not about those who died. It's about hearing God's warning of his judgment and repenting of our sin. Because there's nothing wrong with me. This is how people respond today. If you talk to some people about Jesus, they'll say, no, I'm okay, I'm all right. There's nothing wrong in my life. Leave me alone with that stuff. And they'll look at others and say, yeah, they need to take care of that or this person, and they deserve that. And Jesus is dealing with that attitude. He says, except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. Well, 
Look at the last little thought he gives. This concludes the, 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 the uh, con this concludes this section, this teaching, verses six through nine. A window of mercy. Jesus concludes this section with a clear parable, just like he did about the man going to the judge, right? There's time to repent. Take care of it now before it's too late. Look at this clear parable he gives. He spake also this parable. A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard. And he came and sought fruit thereon and found none. Now we'd say, that's bad. But look at what he says in verse 7. Then said he under the dresser of his vineyard, Behold, these three years I come seeking fruit on this fig tree and find none. Now, now do you get it? One year, what happened? Well, let's do some work to the tree. Let's see. Second year, hmm. Man, that's a lot. Let's put some fertilizer. Let's dig. Third year? This tree's dead. It's only leaves. Remember that parable? It's only leaves. There's no fruit. So he says, verse 7, the end of verse 7, look what it says, cut it down. Why? Cut and cover it in the ground. It's no use. It's pointless. Get rid of it. And he answered. Now that's the master, certain man, verse 6, who said to the dresser, verse 7, the guy taking care of it for him. Well, the guy taking care of it, verse 8, he answering said unto him, Lord, by the way, interesting that he uses the word Lord in response when he's called a certain man in verse 6. The word Lord means master, but I think in the context, it's getting us to see Jesus. Lord, Jesus, let the tree alone, let it alone this year also, till I shall dig about it and dung it, fertilize it, and if it bear fruit, <laughs> well... And if not, then after that, thou shalt cut down. Can you see it? Can you see the picture that Jesus is giving? Jesus came to give life. For God so loved the world. He came not to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. But when we reject Jesus, there's no other answer. There's no other hope. There's no other protection. We now face the judgment of God. So this fig tree becomes a very clear picture, doesn't it? It's a fig tree that hasn't been bearing fruit for three years. And the man's been patient. The tree continues to be fruitless. No matter what the man does, the tree will not bear fruit. That's Israel. I don't think we can read too much into the numbers. I, 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 we can't make every part of a parable mean something. Who's the dresser? Who's the worker? You know what I mean? And, and when someone says it's the Holy Spirit, yeah, but, but then Jesus is the Lord but then you have the Father in heaven. So we, I don't think we can make too much of it, but Jesus has been ministering at this point for about three years. So I, I'm, I just don't go too far into that, but maybe there's more to it than we can see. That's all I'm saying. For three years, Israel's continued to reject their Messiah. So verse seven, the man in the parable says, I'm done with it, cut it down. Why am I covering throughout the ground? It's over. This tree's not doing anything. It's no good. It's empty. It's useless. Israel has, has missed the truth. Cut it down. But the worker asked for more time. Verse 8. A picture, a window of mercy. The worker asked for more time. This is God's grace for Israel and for man and his sin. And that's where you can't push the numbers because he only says one more year. <clears throat> we don't know how long God's going to give each person. Or the children of Israel, we know now that it was till 80, 70 sometime when, when uh, Rome came and destroyed them. We don't know how long God's going to give each person today or how long his, his age of grace is going to last. The point is, give it some time. God give it mercy. God show mercy. God's grace for Israel. God's grace for man and his sin. What does the Bible say? He's not willing that any should perish. But look at verse 9. Because the day of grace will end. What does he say in verse 9? If it bear fruit, ah, yes. And if not, then after that thou shalt cut it down. Thou shalt. The tree will come down. That takes us back on purpose now to why we read John the Baptist warning in, John, in Luke chapter 3. What did he say at the beginning of Jesus' ministry? The axe is being laid to the root of the tree. And if we continue to reject Jesus, guess what's going to happen to that tree? It's going to be cut down. No more life, 
no more hope. The tree would eventually be cut down if it didn't bear fruit. And that's what's happening to Israel. Now, that's what's happening to individual lives too. How many people hear about Jesus and continue on? How many people drive by and read this church sign? How many people get invited to hear the gospel? How many people have a worker, a co-worker, who's living a different life? And they know it's something about them, but they don't want anything to do with it. I don't want anything to do with that religious stuff. And God's grace and God's work and God's calling them. But the fire is coming. The tree is going to be cut down. This whole passage is a warning about judgment. Interesting, isn't it, that on the day we celebrate Jesus entering Jerusalem on a donkey, we come to a passage that talks about discerning the time. And that's exactly what God wants people to do today. The time of grace and salvation is now. 2 Corinthians, now is the day of salvation. Behold, now is the appointed time. Israel missed God's grace and mercy in Jesus. They didn't discern their time. Judgment came. And man today must discern the time of grace and mercy because judgment's coming. Here's what the Bible says. Hebrews chapter uh, 9. As it is appointed unto man once to die, but after this to judge. Man today must discern the time of grace and mercy by repenting and turning in faith to Jesus. Let's pray together. God, thank you for that help in our hearts to help us discern. We know the Bible teaches that Satan has blinded the minds of those who believe not, lest they see the glorious light of Christ. Thank you for opening our eyes and, and understanding. We pray that others would have their eyes open and that they would discern the time. Or they might, people today might be able to look around and say, I can understand this politically, I can understand this and financially, but are they really understanding, are they understanding what really matters? Life in Christ, salvation from sin, eternal presence of God or eternal judgment separated from God forever in hell. We pray that people would discern the time. Help us be able to, to give that message in this time of grace so that people can come in salvation to Christ. But we pray that discerning the time would be what people are doing. That they're seeing, even in our country right now with everything going on, God is calling people to life in Christ. Thank you for this truth and help us tell others and help them see the moment of salvation. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. 411. Take your hymn books to 411 as we close this.